Hey Angie, I know I've been encouraging you to use Lightroom and shoot in RAW for a bit now, and I, it's a little bit of a, it's a learning curve, a little bit, to get going with Lightroom and to get fairly efficient so you're not slow with it. So I thought it's only right that I try and help you out a little and create something for you to get up to speed with it more quickly and efficiently. So this is my first attempt at something like this to record my screen and, and basically what my point here is to show my basic workflow of Lightroom. Uh, I'm using the Creative Cloud um, Lightroom Classic CC versus the new more web-based one without the word classic. Uh, the new or the old classic which is still updated is the more robust one and the one that people have been using for years and uh, I guess it is uh, so now August 2018 so whatever version is current with Adobe Lightroom Classic CC but anyway so the first part it's gonna be a little dry uh, I think together we can get through it it's even before editing I'm gonna show you how I get my photos from the camera to the computer and then into Lightroom I'll try and make it fast that's the driest part of all this so um, in the past, many years ago, I heard somebody say you shouldn't import or copy them right from your camera using Lightroom to get them into Lightroom for fear of corrupting the files and losing photos before you have them backed up. So I guess I've just been doing it that this way. Um, it might be, it's probably outdated the way I'm doing it, but it still works for me real well. So I'm actually using the computer's operating system and file system to copy them from the the camera's memory card into the computer uh, separate. I'm not even opened up Lightroom yet. So like on my desktop now, this Kelsey is my, I store my files on an external hard drive and then untitled, that is actually the, the SD card for my camera plugged into my computer. So opening up my external hard drive, I have this template which is this is my file structure that I keep using over and over and these are just empty folders at this point um, but what well let's do this so my photos these are the photos I have on this particular drive and I create file names like this where I put the year month and date to keep them time based so they can just find them and then a name that means something relevant to me to the shoot so what I to do this, I basically I copy this each time I'm gonna add new photos. So I'm gonna copy and I'm gonna paste it here. So I have so now in my photos where my files where my photos are, I have this guy, this template, which is that. And I just do this every time I bring in new photos. So now I need to rename the the, the copy of the, the template I just put in. So it is 18, the eighth month, and the 16th. I'm going to just call this sample workflow. Just making this up as I go. So now I'm going to, so now I'm actually in year 18, eighth month, 16th day sample workflow. And these are my folders. Some of them I actually, a lot of these I actually rarely use at this point, but it's just my hierarchy that I use over and over just to keep things consistent. And actually I import all my photos from that particular shoot. They go into RAW, or it's number one, just to keep them in order. So I'm gonna open up RAW. And then now going back to, this is the, it says Untitled, this is actually the memory card from my camera. I'm gonna open that up. I took three shots just a little bit ago to for this purpose. They're just well, they are what they are. So here, so now I got the I highlight three. This is where I'm saying I use the computer's operating system. I don't copy them using Lightroom from the camera directly. And then I am going to copy and I'll paste them here. So they're still on my actual, they're still on the actual camera SD card. So I can actually 
get rid of the camera card now. So I am done with that. And now this Kelsey, where all my photos are, here's my new, three new photos, and they are in raw of this sample workflow. So now they are actually on the computer, but they're not in Lightroom yet. So that is just the what I do throughout as I get new photos. Um, at this point, now I would actually open up Lightroom. Again, it's Lightroom Classic CC, not the newer mobile version without the word classic and right now this is just the last image I was looking at it opens up to automatically so oh I want to be in the library module it opened up in develop but so yeah opening up in library and this is just the last photo shoot I worked on or photos I worked on but so we need to import these photos into Lightroom. They're on the computer, but they're not actually into my Lightroom catalog yet. So over here on the left, I'm going to click Import, which opens up the Import module, dialog box, I don't know, something, Import. So on the left, we have Source. In the center is going to be Images, and then on the right is like the destination to my catalog. So left to right, we got the Source and then the destination. This, Kelsey, is my external hard drive. This is that same file structure we just looked at. And we want to be here in the August 16, 2018 sample workflow. I'm going to click. Um, pro tip here, click on the, the photos are in RAW. Yes, you saw me put them in RAW. But at this, for importing, go to the top folder for that photo shoot and actually highlight the folder name, not the raw. Um, they will import. It works, of course. Not of course. You wouldn't. You know, this is the tutorial, but it works. It's just it doesn't work as well for a reason. I guess I'm not going to get into at this point. It's so yeah. Anyways, so here's the three images that I took earlier. Um, you can see they have check marks here. Over here we got to uncheck all, check all. Um, typically, you're going to have a whole bunch of photos, not just three, but for this. And going back to that, I already copied them to the computer. So they are on the computer already. They're just not in the catalog. For that reason and that the method that I do it, up here it says add. We want it to make sure it's you're adding to the catalog. You're not copying them or moving them because there are you're not going to move them from where I already put them. They're already in the file structure, so you just leave them as that. You're just adding them to the catalog. Uh, for people who might import directly from their camera using Lightroom, not the computer's operating system or file manager or whatever, they would likely use move or copy. But the way I do it, so what's been working for me is I, I add them to the catalog. Um, so again, all three are checked. Over on the right, to my catalog, which is, again, we're adding to the catalog. Um, build previews. I have them as one-to-one, -one, and then I always have these two checked. Build smart previews and don't Import sus suspected duplicates. Um, I guess that's fairly self-explanatory. The duplicates, it'll actually if you if it if you're trying to import an image that's already in the catalog, it'll show up, but it's going to be all grayed out because, until you uncheck that. Um, pretty uncommon you're going to run into that scenario, but just I guess be aware. These other items at this point I'm not going to get into. Um, just trying to keep it the basic workflow. So now. I have my images, I have those checked, and it's one-to-one. -one. I'm going to click Import, and normally this process takes a little bit, but with only three images, it should be pretty fast. Up here on the left, top left, there was the import process, and it's still finishing up. And at this point, okay, smart previews were built and already exist for three photos. I could probably check, don't show that again, but I always click OK. And it is finishing up with those one-to-one -one previews. Okay, so these three photos are now fully imported into Lightroom. Okay, so now your photos are imported into the Lightroom catalog. And up here in the upper right, you can see that we are in the library. Um, that is where, well, I guess on the right, I'm kind of all over the place, but on the right here is metadata and a histogram your camera settings um, 
on the left, jumping all the way over to the left, you got a, this is the, the currently active image, and then here's that file structure that is actually on my computer of, of my folders that's part of my Lightroom catalog. Uh, the very top, Navigator, uh, fit, fill, one by one, two by one, you can change, those can be changed, but, well, that is relevant to, so it's now, and I'm all over the place. So if I double click this one, it's going to fill the middle, and it's large an Im a large image. Uh, it is on fit, so it fits within the, the center pane of space there. If I go to one to one, that is actually 100%. Um, of looking at the photo at 100% full high res. And two to one with it, the two in front should actually be larger yet. Um, you can choose these various ones. Fill, fills the screen in either width or height. But anyways, back to fit. And to get back to the, it's called the grid, where you see multiple images in, in the grid pattern, it's, you hit the keyboard shortcut G for grid. I imagine you can go up to view or something across the top, but G for grid on the keyboard. And you can double click it, back to G for grid. Um, let's see, you can like shift and highlight three or just one. None. I guess that's kind of typical computer thing. So let's see. In the library, you would be, I've always heard it called as culling. And that's like looking for the, the good photos you want to really show off, or the opposite, the, the bad rejects that aren't worth anyone ever seeing. So that process you do here in the library. So I'm, the way I do it, I go through every photo one by one. Um, I expand it large. I can use my keyboard left and right arrow keys to toggle on the toggle, meaning like scroll through. Toggle's not a great word. On the bottom here, you have it'll fill up with all your photos that are in this particular group that you're working with. Um, but using my right arrow key, you can see it's, and then left, it's going between the, the photos on the across the bottom and it correlates to the main photo up top so say I really like this photo I think this one is the one that's like I would maybe call a hero image and one I'm gonna spend a lot of time on and try and really impress people with I want to flag that or tag it as as well they call it a pick and the keyboard shortcut is P for pick so I'm gonna just click P and it says flag as pick. And also down on the, the row of images, you can see there's a now a white flag on the one that was a pick. So say this one. I happen to think it's terrible and don't want anyone to see it. I would hit X. But X is actually standing for reject. I guess X was already taken. So you'd hit X and it's set as a reject and now it has a black flag on it. And this might not seem like real relevant or, or important, valid, but it actually, as you get accustomed to it and have a lot of photos, it, these kinds of things, these flagging or tagging of images can really help you efficiently find photos or group them or, or even work to edit with them. Um, so now I'm gonna make this one a pick as well, just for the example. So now I have two with the white flag. And keyboard shortcut is the backslash. I'm not even sure what the, basically that brings up, oh, filters. So we got text, attribute, metadata, and none. So I hit backslash again, I believe that'll disappear, yeah. Oh yeah, right there, it just showed it on the bottom of the screen, backslash. What I'm getting at though is I'm gonna click attribute. And now, say I hit this, this is the white, no flag, and black. I'm going to hit the white flag. So now, it is only going to show me those, those real special photos that I went through. Maybe I went through 100 photos, and I have 12 that are flagged as, as pics. And those are the ones that I know I want to work on and spend some time on. So now only those 12 would be here. And that ties into when you're editing photos. Now I know where 
not now I know like oh I just I have these twelve in front of me that I already know are the good ones and I don't have to hunt for them. Um, alternately, you could hit the black flag and this group would be multiple photos I would presume um, in a large photo shoot and those would just be the all the rejects. There are also additional ways to tag and flag photos. Um, it's kind of whatever whatever floats your boat, whatever you like. I have found that I'll have my all my white flag, my picks, you know, I'll have like 10 photos here, hypothetically. But I know like this one, let's go with this one, is like for sure I want to put on like social media. But I'm not going to put all those other 10s on there. My personal way is then I... Oh, I did that wrong. See, try something new while I'm recording. I just right clicked. So I right clicked here, and I'm going to the way I've done it. I'm going to set color label red. So now it has a red flag to it. And the way I do it is then I know all the red flag ones. I'm going to, that's like the smallest quantity of my best, and those I'm going to put on like social media or something. Uh, then I presume I could click the red here. That's what I tried earlier, and it didn't work. So it's just going to show the reds. And the white flags, the picks, but, um, or you can do star rating. We could star things one through, I guess it's five stars. Yeah. So there's many ways to whatever, whatever you like to distinguish the good ones, the not so good ones. And it is, it sounds maybe sounds small or not real important, but it does play a well into becoming more efficient when you have large quantities of photos and, and also to find photos, um, say months later, you can just go in and bam, hit the, the picks and, and you have this small collection or, or the reds or for my case or whatever it be. So now, say I want to edit this photo here. So this one I know is going on social media and I'm ready to edit it. Um, in the library module, you don't edit, you go into the develop to edit. Develop is where the magic happens, supposedly. So it's highlighted. You can click develop. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I guess my habit is I just click D on the keyboard, keyboard shortcut D for develop. So I just click D. I guess it's the same result. So whatever works for you. But yes, so now we're here in develop and not library. Develop now, this, this is all different on the right from what we just had. And so now we are ready to actually start editing. Um, should be the more fun aspect of this, this, this. And on the right side, that is the most important. That is where all your tools are. So this is my workflow. Um, basically do the same general thing every photo, just the, the values change per photo. And I do the same like 80% on, I think on probably most photos, and then the last 20% is more more specific tools, depending on what I'm looking for to achieve or what I see or what I'm trying to correct. I didn't get well in the shot. Um, so yeah, my the consistent flow that I personally always do, and of course everyone has their own ways, and my way is not necessarily the right way, but it's what works for me. It's and what's what I do. So enough of that. First thing I do is over here to lens correction. Right from the start, remove chromatic aberrations. I check that. Even if I might not even have any, I just I just check it every time. I'm sure that can be debated, but and then enable profile corrections. That is for the lens and it knows which lens I used and the photo actually changed a little. My my practice with this is I will check it and uncheck it, and if I don't like what it did, well then I will leave it unchecked. Um, most of the times I actually do enable the, the lens profile corrections, just kind of by default, but if I really don't like the way it looks, I'll just uncheck it. That is my step one, pretty much every photo. Then, next step that I always do, in order, I work on the, the basics panel. Is it a panel? We'll call it panel. And I I've kind of figured out that I'm trying to realize I think I tend to shoot underexposed because I'm worried about highlights too much. And my photos are more on the darker side. 
and then I just anticipate ex correcting and post-processing and salvaging them shadows and bringing out the detail with the tools and I'm starting to think maybe I should get it a little more well balanced in camera but maybe that kind of ties into what my first steps are but I, all these YouTube videos I've watched to help me get going pretty much do the same first step or two so anyways the first thing I look at is the shadows slider I will bring that to the right to this maybe is not a great photo um, for editing but I will bring that to the right kind of just eyeballing where I think shadows should be to bring out detail um, the thing I guess I feel once you get into the 40s and higher you start adding noise noise to the, the sh photo so then to maybe balance that I will potentially go with exposure and bring that up anywhere like 0.10 to 0.4 it all depends on the photo um, and again maybe this isn't the best photo for demonstrating editing but you can actually click in here and click up and down with your arrow keys as well which is I do that a lot actually I think it's a little handier than the slider oh yeah another tip you can click here and bring out I thought you could oh making me look dumb I've seen others do it you can slide them I mean it's a setting I got checked or something but anyways so then so we got shadows is first step then either I'll, I'll play with the highlights some I'm sorry exposure and then also going left with highlights to recover highlights that potentially could be blown out um, those are my first things I focus on shadows increasing to bring out detail and trying to not get up into the 40s or too much higher but each photo is different you can't just listen to my numbers and then I'll play with exposure if I feel I'm bringing the shadows slide up too high right so just find that balance to avoid noise and in the photo and then potentially bring highlights almost always bring highlights down some it's pretty uncommon for you to bring highlights up unless I'm going for a certain look or something happened then highlight I mean some photos I've even gone literally to 100 on highlights but that's anywhere from that's a pretty broad range I'll get highlights each photo is different exposure 0.10 to 0.5 or so shadows I've gone up into the 50s but I try and keep it 30s or 40s um, whites then I'll, I'll look at whites you can either eyeball it or what I t oftentimes do is I hold down the well, on a Mac the option key on a PC it's the alt key if you hold that down so I'm still holding that key down on the keyboard and now I click this and as I drag it to the right I will get it to where there's just you just start to see that and then I'll release and that's finding your like the uh, whites I think it's I don't know if it's where it starts to potentially blow out I don't know <laughs> Duh. Um, but you can just eyeball it too a lot of the sliders actually have this alt key or option key ability to to show you on the, the center screen here more details of what's what it's doing so then after that I tend to go to contrast I think pretty much almost every photo to me needs a little contrast um, I'll tend to go anywhere from three or four up to maybe 20 each photo is different but I add contrast and then next in line for my workflow is I go to clarity and I'll add a little clarity um, anywhere from like 5 to 30 40 each it's it it just varies but that is my sequence and next I go to vibrance and saturation but I tend to use vibrance much more than saturation vibrance seems to be have a little more intelligence to it I think it's working the shadows instead of where saturation is just 100% affects everything equally like a blanket so I I like vivid and bold images so I 
tend to increase my vibrance. Um, who knows, five to 20 or 30 each. It varies, of course, I keep saying. And then I, after I find where I like that, then I go to saturation and I will oftentimes move it up a little, but not, not as much as vibrance. Sometimes I'll just do no saturation and some vibrance. Uh, finally here, blacks. I guess personally, I usually ch play with it, but I don't end up using it very much. Um, already contrast and clarity are bringing in, I think, are changing the blacks. So I find myself using blacks not that often. Um, potentially it's something in time I will learn or use to incorporate more. Then some photos, I will mess with the the, the tint, tint and temp. Say I want it to be a little cooler or a little warmer. You know, just a matter of slide in just a little bit. Um, you can double click these and they go back to where they were originally. You can also double click the word. Um, here's another example where I'll click here and I'll use the keyboard up and down instead of the, the sliding with the mouse. While I look at the center screen, I just have my fingers on the keyboard. I think I like the, that method a little better. Uh, tint, maybe like a, a, a night sky, I would add, go to the right with tint to add some magenta, or skin tones, maybe I might go a little bit, just a hint of away from magenta towards green if I think the skin tones don't look well. At those I am adjusting at that point or playing with. Um, I don't always adjust them for every photo, no. So at this point, that completes the basic panel. Then I will typically now go to detail. And this is the sharpening. I've actually heard and I believe it's best to wait for sharpening until the more near the end instead of right at the beginning and actually some of the other tools that you use will do a little sharpening on their own. Um, these I probably don't know as much about these as I should. I think 40 is the default and I sometimes move it back and forth and see but I tend to just leave it at 40. In radius and detail I tend to just leave them at their defaults. Um, one other for sharpening and noise reduction, pro tip here, you really always should be looking at it one to one or 100% to, to see what you're doing because it's, you can easily sharpen too much to too much noise reduction and, and really ruin a photo unknowingly if you're not careful. So always do it 100% or one to one. But I'm sorry, back to the sharpening. The, the slider that I always Every photo I, when I sharpen, I do use, is, that is the masking. And here, it's another one of those, hold down the option on the keyboard or Alt on a PC, and slide the, so now I just clicked and I'm holding it, it turns white. White means that will be sharpened. If I go all the way to the right, black means it won't be sharpened. So you can see the white outline of the UST, that is basically what's gonna be sharpened and just some of the edges. So here I, I slide this around till I f feel I have have what should be sharpened getting sharpened and what shouldn't in black so the black is not being sharpened. Um, for example, water or skies should not be sharpened. So I would slide this in a landscape photo so the water in the, in the sky is black and whether it be trees or whatever the foreground those would be in the whitish, so they are being sharpened, or maybe the person or something. Um, like skin tones as well. Skins, you want to limit on how much you're, you're sharpening because seeing people's pores is not overly flattering. Luminosity, which is noise reduction, I don't play with it much, I so I don't, I can't speak on it very well. Um, 
I know if you get start doing too much, you lose detail. That's one of my concerns. Um, so yeah, I don't actually use that much. So I can't speak on it a whole lot. Sorry. Now, I am near done with the basics of this photo, or the photo that you know, you're working on. Um, effects, effects panel. Actually, let me, so at this point I've been working on it for a moment and I'm starting to get a feel for my composition and I, I might tend to think if I need to crop or not by this point. I, I resist to try and crop right at the beginning, I wait. So over here is the crop tool, the square. So I click it and we get this grid on the screen. This paddle lock means it keeps the original camera's aspect ratio. Um, I can't go... Well, if I unclick it, now I can do this kind of stuff, just freeform it. I tend to leave it as, as the camera was shot, unless things like Instagram, which you know, they have their own, a different ratio. But, um, so you just drag it to what you're looking for. And I can do this. And then I would just hit enter. So now it is cropped. And then the next thing that I would do in my typical workflow is effects, which is what I was starting to go to. And a lot of photos look good, look a little better with a, a vignette, vignette, vignoir, vin, yeah. Anyway, so what's that dressing? Vignette, no, anyways. Um, this is actually, there's some intelligence to this. It actually puts the, the vignette, vin, vignette, vin, the thing on the image for you and if you readjust your crop it adjusts it just it again but to get a to apply you actually slide to the left you're going negative you can see it's getting darker here um, if you go to the right it turns white I don't know when you would actually use that so and you can adjust as they call the midpoint roundness feathering it's just on it's on the shape of the vignette, vignette, that doesn't sound right. And you can play with those. To be honest, I actually tend to not. I just do a subtle, subtle one to kind of draw the, the viewer's eye towards the subject. And that, to be honest, is about 80% of what I would do on pretty much any photo. So the next stuff is a little more advanced. It sure isn't that advanced though, but it's just, I guess, level two. That was level one. I'm just making those that verbiage up. Let me open a different photo that might, with these next tools. Oh, I should show over here on the left. This is a, something I meant to. History, on right here on the left. This is all the different adjustments that I have done in the chronological order and it gives the values. You can actually click on these and jump around through the history of what you edited. And since it's it's raw and Lightroom is non-destructive, that you can just keep making adjustments and it, it does not damage the photo, say like a, a JPEG, JPEG would. So here's the original photo, how it just was imported. Uh, right there, import, and here's where I left it. But anyways, oh yeah. So I'm gonna go back to the library, open up a different photo because we're in develop. So I'm gonna hit G for grid. It's just my habit. But library, clicking library would have got us there too. I'm going to go. So here's the same hi file hierarchy that I was talking about earlier. It's on the computer. I'm gonna edit this photo this one has not been edited and it's not a very good photo so I double click it go to the develop you can see all my settings are just as they were but I want to show you the tools I guess as I just made up calling them level two 
Um, they're not that difficult or advanced, but they are definitely good tools to learn and to include. So this one right here under the histogram is the graduated filter. So I'm going to click it once, and now it opened up. These are the tools for this graduated filter. Um, I don't know if this is by default or if it's because I always do it, but it, the exposure slid the, all the way to the left, which is negative 4, but I actually like that. And it's not because that's the, the effect I want, but it allows, it turns where I put the filter, it turns it gray and allows me to see it easily. So a graduated filter is actually a horizontal or vertical gradient straight line. So I'm going to just come at the top, see how it's moving around. You can make it at an angle, however you like, which is, depending on the photo, can be amazing, right? But say you want it to be, hold the shift down. Like, this is common for a lot of computers, programs. Hold the shift down, and now it won't let me twist it. It stays horizontal. Um, so I'll stop it there. You can see it's, it, as it's called, great, great, graduated, whatever, gradient, it starts dark and the effect gets much lighter down here until there's no effect here uh, below this line. And this goes back to the negative four exposure I was talking. It allows me to see it. Uh, if I double click this, it resets that to zero. So now this graduated filter is on here, but none of the sliders are doing anything. So it's not affecting the photo at all. But why I, these are oftentimes will be used like on a, on a sky so you can see the clouds they are hard to see so i'm going to try what about shadows so i'm going to well, that didn't do much for me did it double click to bring it to zero i could go exposure i don't actually want the cloud the sky all gray but i have seen d haze bring yeah so d haze over here for skies i've kind of recently discovered that one um you can go too far and start making things look totally fake so it's, it's all in finding the right balance but i'm sliding the d haze i'm not even looking at the number it's i'm just looking at the, the photo in the center um so it's only affecting it's not affecting down here it's affecting this much less and it's affecting it much more up here back to the gradient um, sharpness, I'm not going to sharpen a sky. I don't think that would be the correct thing to do. Saturation, what's, I assume that's going to bring up, make the colors pop a little bit more in the area that I have it affected on the image. It's not changing any of this down here. Um, highlights, if I bring the highlights down. So, I mean, you can... It's all up to whatever you think you want to use for whatever your needs is. You got all these different tools within this this one filter, um, and you can also I can grab the center and I'm, well, I'm moving the whole thing. I could I thought I thought I could drag it and resize it. Oh yeah, I am. It just didn't give me the crosshair thing. So I am actually shrinking, narrowing the band of the the gradient. So up here it's like full strength. Then it starts to graduate down less and less. And after this line, there's there's nothing there. And here it's making the gradient more gradual above that line's full strength. I think yeah, I can. I can rotate it so you can see the effect. So you can actually. I'm gonna use the shift key to get it vertical. Well, I thought I was. I thought the shift would work. I never have done a gradient vertically. This is my first time ever. But anyway, so you can see the effect it is doing. And I am, say I'm done with that, I'm going to click close. And now this is back to the basic panel. And the gradient's there, but you can't actually see it. Um, so I say go back to there again. This dot is, is that gradient filter. And hovering over it, is the pink is showing me the effect of where it is as well like giving me the orientation of the space it's using and in a gradient so I could click it once and now I'm back into it I can re-edit it again and make changes to it and then click close or I can click it again and actually click new 
and now I start a, a new one, a second one. So you can you can stack multiple ones. Oh, I hit reset and it actually cleared out both. I was thinking it was gonna clear out just that newest one. Huh. I guess I'm not even sure there. But uh, I'll leave that at that. The other tool, uh, very similar but different, is is the radial, the circle. So again, we got the same tools. I think they're identical. But the difference here is you are working with a circle. One big thing for the, the radial, the circle, I almost always have invert checked. If it's not in, so any invert is not unchecked, it's affecting things outside the circle. I click invert, it's affecting in the circle. I would say 90% of the 90% of the time, my purpose of these radial filters is inside the circle. So I always have invert checked. Um, this could be used for say dodging and burning, making some shadows or highlights in some areas to draw some interest in a photo. I've also used it on eyes of people. You, you just kind of you can adjust the size, you, and you can also go one to one. And I would put it over, say their eyes were in shadows too much, or I wanted them to pop a little more. So I've done raise exposure a little. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, this I'm imagining now is eyes, which obviously is totally the wrong photo. But I mean, so these are just examples of where these filters can be used. And if it were eyes, obviously we're on trees. I would do one, get it where I want. I right clicked. I'm going to hit duplicate. And now, just with the normal dragging, left click, I have a second here. And it's identical to the one I just created because I, I had right clicked and chose duplicate. Um, but I'm going to delete it at this point. And I'll delete that one. I'm going to go back to fit. Another tool is this adjustment brush. Again, all these are over here for your disposal to, to be creative and make corrections or enhance things that you like. But this one is more of a, actually you paint where you want and the more you hold it, the, the deeper or the heavier it, it's affecting. Um, I'm just doing this to try and show it a little bit more. So this is total free form and this has its uses if you're maybe well I've used it for landscapes or I'm sure you use it for pretty much anything. Um, so radial is just a circle or not a round circle. Gradient you can just, you can also come up from the bottom and then the brush, adjustment brush, is you're actually painting. But they all have these, I believe they're the identical adjusters, sliders on the right here to do what you want with them. So that, so I've made those adjustments on a photo and, and that looks like crap. Anyways, that's probably as far as I would. It's going to take this at this point for my workflow in Lightroom. That is almost the extent of what I even typically do. I guess the next thing that after you've played with this for a while, and the next thing I would maybe think you could like do a Google search on, or I could show you more, is HSL and its hue, saturation, and luminance. Uh, I don't really want to get into that right now, but like greens, if I think uh, I'm on saturation, if I'm doing a landscape and I think the greens are just too vivid, I, I, this is not vivid in this one, but sometimes it is, you can, I'll, I'll actually reduce the greens, and you're, you're actually going for individual colors in HSL, so that would be maybe the next thing the next advanced tool after these filters up top that you can maybe look into. So say, I don't want to use this photo, I don't want to use that 
photo. So I went back and go back to library, grid, and now this is the photo. Say I'm fully edited, I am happy with it, and I want to, I need to export it out of Lightroom. Because right now it is still raw, which can't be used for like social media or printers or something. You need to export it, typically a JPEG, uh, possibly TIFF file for printer or something like that, or social media via JPEG. So you can right click and go to export and export, or you can over here click export. So I'm going to, so yeah, I'm going to do that now because this photo I want to. I'm happy with it. I want to get it out of Lightroom and actually use it for something. So I'm going to click Export, and this dialog box opens up. On the left here are presets, so they're almost like um, templates for these settings on the right, because each each use might have its own needs for changing these settings around. Whether if it's social media, you're going to have nearly the, the file size or image size that you would if you sent it to the printer, for example. Um, originally, when I first got in here, I think I just started adjusting these kind of my, my own, just randomly, what I was guessing. But after a short bit, I started to, I made user presets, I made my own presets. Like Facebook, for example, I looked. I went online. I figured I did some quick looking on what are the best settings to make Facebook photos look the best, um, because Facebook is going to compress your photo, and so you just wanted to try and look its best on Facebook. And so I'll use that as an example. We'll export the hard drive. I've I've never exported the email or CD drive. I guess my Mac doesn't even have a CD drive or DVD drive. But anyway, so export location. Um, you can actually, at one point I actually did make a specific location for it, but I tend to now have it specify and I just choose like my desktop or, or somewhere where I know I can grab it. I don't check any of these. Uh, file name, I've, I think I've ever changed the file name in an export. Video, I've never imported video into Lightroom at this point. So file settings. Um, again, this is for Facebook. I import image, I'm sorry, I import. Image format is JPEG. Color space is sRGB for computers. Quality, I have it all the way up to 100. Uh, I do not limit the file size, but a person could limit file size. You can put in, you know, how many K, um, thousand K is a mag, so it's a hundred K, but I do not. I, this is full quality JPEG, but image size, I am resizing the image for Facebook. So I am resizing, resize the fit. So I check that and it's based on the long edge. And that's because some pictures are horizontal portrait landscape or some are portrait vertical. So whatever the long edge is, I make it to be 2048 pixels, whether it be vertical or horizontal. And then resolution's 240. I think I got that online, why it's 240 versus say 300 or even 72 pixels per inch. So I've just been leaving it at that. Output sharpening. I have for the few years now, I've been using sharpen for screen, it's checked, and I put amount at standard. But very recently, I'm starting to rethink this, and I'm thinking about to not sharpen on export at all because I do the sharpening the way I want it in my editing. So now I'm second guessing sharpening again on export. But maybe for JPEG, it's good. I don't know, but I feel like I'm already sharpened it the way I want in in the editing processing, post process, whatever. Jesus. Um, so yeah, something I'm going to look into. Metadata, I I leave all metadata. Just just so it's on the associated with the file. Watermarking, I've never actually used that. When I used to watermark my images, which I no longer do, I would actually when I finished editing a photo in Lightroom and export it, then I would bring it to Photoshop and add my watermark as a layer. But that would be the final step. But I actually don't watermark my images any longer. So I don't I'm never doing anything with that here. Uh, Post-processing, I have it show in Finder, which is just going to open up a dialog box showing the, the image in the Finder for Mac, PC, and B. I don't even know offhand what anymore. But anyway, so that is how I 
and then you click export and this is what it's going to create as a JPEG to the files not file size but the image size that I specified so I'm going to click export up here on the left you can see it it's the pr progress bar and so it finished it opened up as it was told to open up the image um, oh yeah I didn't just specify my des desktop it went into that folder I previously stated so so here's that folder image I'm sorry image and it is a JPEG at 2048 long edge which in this photo is the horizontal landscape and now I would just import that directly into Facebook because well 740k so Facebook's gonna shrink it even more but I do seem to get good results with that without it pixelating and turning the photo too too poor looking um and that is about my workflow uh, I really fumbled through that this is my first time trying recording myself like this ever so sorry for the jumping all around and everything but um yeah about pretty much all my photos I do like 80% of the same thing and some some photos I might spend 10 minutes on like my hero shots and I really want to impress somebody I could spend 45 minutes on but say you're doing a wedding and you're just uh, doing basic color correcting you got to get through all those hundreds or thousands of photos and if it's just basic color correcting once you get efficient with it maybe five minutes or or less three minutes a photo uh, there's a way to when you have photos that are like in the same sequence or the same lighting you can kind of batch process them but I'm not going to get into that at this point but that's for if they have the same lighting and they're really just like the same session same so they would take the same settings um, yeah I don't know there's there's so much more but that's the basics of it that, that, cause that's a primer that gets you started and YouTube searches are your friend for specific tools or, or questions or topics you just search Lightroom like HSL and you can get some good good tutorials there better than mine obviously and if you do that a few times at least I did I, I started to find actually YouTube youtubers that I like their videos over other people and then I started subscribing to their channels so it's there's so much info out there and I kinda didn't want to throw out too much uh, just to get going to bite off more than you know you can chew I don't want you to be overwhelmed. I want it to, you know, be relatively painless, and and from there you just grow and you expand more, and you get faster and you get higher skilled with it. I do really think if you stick to it for just a little while, it's come with me. If you have to force yourself, it'll become quick, quicker, and and I think I do really believe you'll like the results. Um, I guess that's all. I'm, I guess I'm gonna leave it there. Kind of I could keep babbling but I do that enough so if you've made it this far well thanks for watching and I know my quality wasn't so special but yeah it's first try so already well thanks I'll talk to you later